having a few little technical issues here again. No way. All right. Oh, okay. So it's working. It said it wouldn't live stream for a couple minutes. Okay. So just a, a few more things in. I will add this stuff. So I'll do a little section on myths. And myths always fascinate me because there's so much of about how a society looks at themselves and justifies who they are. And Oh, got a little double voice here. All right, so I got the monitor on. All right, yeah, I don't know what happened. I had to use Chrome because I'm using Google. It's a complex thing. And it just went off on YouTube when I was trying to set up the channel for this. That's why I was a couple minutes late. And so it seems to be working. And so I talked about myths and compared it to folklore and, folk and fables and all of that. And so, but the myths really are this creation of society and it means so much about the ideology of it. The image that a country wants to portray it's through its myths. And that's why I went through the George Washington ones, this greater than life myth or the pilgrims and Thanksgiving. And so let's get to one more big one. I think the last one was the first, the harvest, the regular harvest festival. And by the way, turkeys came about by a combination of a number of different things, but the whole thing about eating turkeys was in the 1880s. I should add that nobody really wanted turkeys to be the national bird. That was not Ben Franklin's goal, but it still makes a great story, but that's another myth. But let's get back to the Mayflower Compact. The, May the Mayflower Compact, which was written on the Mayflower that the separatists wrote on, and it's going to come down as this symbol of the first self-government of the United States. This idea that the United States has created a system where all people have a voice in government, a term that they would um, look at as self-determination or even the roots of small d democracy, that that was the basis of the United States as seen with the Mayflower Compact. And even though you can make the argument if you're being really technically correct, that the first permanent British settlement basically was Jamestown in 1607, but we need to remember the separatists and the Puritans because of the Mayflower Compact. And so this idea of self-government, well, yeah, they did make this document up. And basically the document was is that everybody who is on the Mayflower will be treated relatively equally and will share and share and like, and certain people will not be able to hoard goods in this wild wilderness because they arrived in winter, a terrible time with a shortage of supplies. Fortunately, as I told you before, the village, they are already coming into a cleared path, easy to make a village that they would call Plymouth. But this would be, uh, oh, as I said, the basis of American democracy. But in reality, those people on the, those people who were on the Mayflower, only about, 40% were actually real separatists. To fill up the ship and also get enough people willing to do it, they had to recruit people, some from the Netherlands, mostly from England, even though they had been in the Netherlands to escape the evils of the other religions. Remember the whole thing about religious freedom was never true? Well, they weren't actually separatists. And most of the people who went there, they agreed to go on the Mayflower, not to go create this uh, city of the blessed, or as the Puritans would call it eventually, a city on the hill. They went because they thought they were going to Jamestown because they still believe two things. First off, that Jamestown was made out of gold. And if you couldn't get gold, they'll get land and tobacco and slaves and get rich. So when they arrived there, uh, 500 miles north of where they thought they were going in the middle of winter, they were furious and threatened to cut the throats of the separatists and go down to Jamestown. And so what did they do? They made it very clear. If you try to make us your virtual servants, we will go to Jamestown. And so they came up with this agreement that we'll share and share alike. And so the myth of this being some noble form of self-government, and that is why they came to the new world to create the basis of American democracy, which is simply not true. It was just to keep their throats from being cut. Makes a good story, but I do like that picture of one of these sailors signing this. And if you ever get a chance to go to Plymouth, they have a, a copy of the Mayflower there. And it is terrifyingly small. It is such a small little boat to imagine crossing the Atlantic in that thing. But that's another myth. Great amount of myths there. 
I do like the buckle myths. Why were all these myths there? Why the pilgrims? Why do we hear about the pilgrims all the time and then indirectly the Puritans? Well, there's a couple different reasons. First off, the, after the Civil War, there was a real desire to justify the, the war, justify that the North won, and also to glorify New England and those who fought on the side of the North. And so publishing in the United States really had its start in Boston. Here are two books, American history books published in Boston. You can see that one in 1897. So here's Boston, the center of publishing, just at a time of intense American nationalism in, um, after the Civil War. And so they began to glorify the founding fathers, but they began to glorify their roots, trying to give the idea that the United States got its real start in Boston and Massachusetts, not Virginia. Virginia, where the capital of the Confederacy was, Richmond. It couldn't be there. And so the real roots, the real founding of the country, Boston. And that's where you get the term pilgrims. Nobody ever referred to the separatists as pilgrims, ever until this run of publishing. And they changed their name to, or they the name was changed to Pilgrims because of the Civil War. Separatist, uh, doesn't that kind of sound like someone separating for the country? Pilgrims, those who are looking for the true answer. Don't think in terms of a religious nature, just think of somebody who's on the search for a better life, the Pilgrims. So that's where the myth comes from, and then that would have all sorts of effects down through history. So you have this to justify the Industrial Revolution. Work hard and don't complain about your wages. The Puritan work ethic. All of this would come out of it, out of this idea. And also the justification of taking this land from American Indians, of not just taking the land, but like Thanksgiving, giving American Indians civilization. So, speaking of myths, let's get real quick to the Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell, if you get a chance to go to Philadelphia and really have a desire to stand in a line, I mean, if you really want to stand in a line, go to the Liberty Bell. And it's a bell, and there is a picture of it, I could not find the picture of me standing next to it, and then I decided I didn't want to show you a picture of me standing next to it because I, of course, am like everybody else and will do dumb touristy thing too. But, all right, maybe I'll find it. But there is a Liberty Bell, and the idea was that it was rung so hard on July 4th for Independent. There is a picture of it ringing the bell so hard that it cracked because of the vigor and the enthusiasm over Independence and Liberty. And so there's all kinds of Liberty Bell references. Of course, this is going to become the symbol of Philadelphia and a big tourist trap. Well, of course that's not true. There's no evidence that that was rung any at all for the Declaration of Independence because on July 4th, the Declaration of Independence, I didn't really know about it. Nobody really knew about it. I'll explain it in a second on that July 4th would have mattered. And... It probably cracked 20 or 30 years earlier. So this was just like Plymouth Rock, another great story that has this myth. And this idea of it, though, is that this we are better than other people. We have this exceptionalism that when we became independent, even metal, even bronze will crack because of, the, of, of how vigorous American freedom is. Why is this there? I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it. So that gets the Independence Day one, you already know. And if you had me for AP US history, I've talked about this before and most of you already know it, but it's just such an enduring myth that Independence Day was July 4th. And there's the Declaration of Independence, July 4th, 1776. And this will be celebrated or celebrated to this day with fireworks and sales for cars and, and stakes. But who knows what Independence Day will be like this year? I guess we'll all be uh, standing apart with a mask on. And here is an idealized declaration or Independence Day celebration in the 1850s. Here is a picture from a German propaganda book talking of showing Americans pulling down the statue of King George III in Philadelphia on July 4th for Independence Day. And it was to promote German nationalism in the 1848 revolution. 
If you've ever seen the famous picture of Washington crossing the Delaware, that also was done by a German to show American independence um, can be a symbol for German, for a German nationalism and a German state. Because it was painted by a German, I guess I should get to the point. And so to this day, we have Independence Day, and it would be kind of personified by exactly 50 years after that was written on the Declaration of Independence, both John Adams, right, where's my mouse, John Adams right here, and Thomas Jefferson, two of the five authors of the Declaration of Independence, Independence both died on July 4th, 1850, or 1826, exactly 50 years after the Declaration of Independence signed, which that is not a myth, that really happened, but that perpetuates the myth. Like they were supposed to die on that day, and this would promote the idea of, well, there's something special. We're coming to manifest destiny, obviously. And so here is Uncle Sam and Lady Columbia looking at <laughs> this wild crew of Americans and all this different group. But um, false alarm meaning something bad could happen. But look at all these new people, including places like Puerto Rico and everybody else. So the 4th of July. And the amazing thing is, why on the 4th of July? Okay, most of you probably know the elements of the truth here, but, or little elements of when the actual Independence Day was. But there's a few reasons why. First off, when July 4th, 1776 became celebrated, it was first by patriots during the war to try to find something to unify the patriots together because the handbill that announced independence would be sent all over and posted on walls or on uh, trees or poles would be, that would say July 4th. So patriots try to use this as we need a date to rally because there was no clear independence day for anybody before 1776. They had been talking about, and we'll give kind of a formal day, but there's actually three different days technically they could use, but they wanted to find something they could grab onto. And next, during the ratification battle for the Constitution, that became a big thing to rally those who wants the, want the Constitution. They celebrated July 4th, made a big deal about it in 1788 in places like Pennsylvania and New York. Remember, some of you uh, probably remember that the Federalist Papers came out of New York and the ratification would be on that day. The ratification, or I'm sorry, the ratification of the Constitution, they would unify all the, the uh, Federalists who want the Constitution behind one common idea. We are fulfilling the goals of the Declaration of Independence. And you see the same thing with the first political parties. That was a big rallying point. The first parties would be the Republicans and the Federalists, and they would come together and unify on July 4th, all the Federalists together, a date that they could show their part or unity to this idea, this brand new thing called a political party. By the way, here's an anti-Jefferson party or anti-Jefferson cartoon for the Federalists of him pulling down the edifice of state. In fact, John Adams, he would say this about what he thought was Independence Day. If you can't read it, I, this is one thing, if I put it up on the screen, I'll let you read it, but it might be a little difficult. So if it says, it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade and, and shoes, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward, forevermore. By the way, shoes, that's shows, like uh, variety shows and plays and singing, shoes. And there's John Adams, this very stylized painting of them presenting to John Hancock the Declaration of Independence. But what did John Adams really say in that about? Hmm, the picture gone. <laughs> That's what he's talking about right here. It got out of order. July 2nd was the actual date that the resolution would be signed. Here's the actual resolution agreed to July 2nd, 1776, that the United States is independent. And they made this proclamation and virtually everybody then left because Philadelphia is hot as an oven. 
in July. They want to get the heck out of there and also go back home because harvest season's coming up. And so they left. So when the document was ready on July 4th, there was nobody there to sign it. So if you see the Declaration of Independence with, Independence with signatures on it, that was done in October and September to try to unify those who wanted independence in the dark days of the Revolutionary War after New York fell to the British. So July 2nd is when it happened. But with the British winning, they needed to show that they meant it. So they all signed that Declaration of Independence months after the actual document uh, was released on July 4th. They signed it in October and September to show they meant it, they meant independence and that added credence to that handbill. So let's get back to this then. So another myth, and this is the myth of the founding fathers. And the founding fathers, this whole myth would be created. In fact, we all have this myth and the glorification of the founding fathers. And I'm always fascinated how people can say we want to get back to the ideals of the founding fathers. And this is a very creepy picture of the various um, people at the Constitutional Convention. And that's supposed to be George Mason. And that is just creepy. By the way, no, they rarely ever wore wigs. That's uh, another thing only for paintings. But, you know, whatever. But this idea that they want to create a land of the free, this concept that it will be for everybody, this very altruistic version that they were fighting the Revolutionary War and the Constitution to provide liberty and to promote the general welfare for everybody. Now, yes, they were foresighted. Yes, they were altruistic, but let's be clear about it. Men like Ben Franklin right here and George Mason, two of the leading, both of them were at the Declaration of Independence. Franklin was an author of the Declaration of Independence. And both were at the Constitu Constitutional Convention, and Mason had great influence there. They were very prominent businessmen. Very prominent businessmen. Here's uh, Madison, Washington. Very rich landlords. Very rich uh, uh, enslaved. Same with like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams was a very prosperous lawyer. They had personal self-interest, but this idea that they were creating this founding or creating this land of the free and therefore they were above criticism they worked together they fought for only what's right this gets back to the kind of the George Washington myth that only a few people can actually succeed this and that means most of us are average and therefore we must accept their leadership but the reality was there's going to be this real glorification of the founding fathers at the exact same time that we start hearing about the pilgrims. After the Civil War, both started in the North, but the North glorified the founding fathers to say that they are following in the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. And then the South, as they would go back in time and try to justify why they fought and started the Civil War, they would try to say, we are actually fought, um, the successors to the Declaration of Independence. And so, same deal, just like what happened with the Pilgrims. It's amazing how these myths have this little cycle. But don't forget, once you start a myth, these are going to be taught in class. You know, I was looking at, at a different myth, and I found this interesting video about, about how science, uh, myths start in science. And once you start teaching it, it becomes over and over that not only is the myth um, pushed on throughout history, Soon people begin to believe it's real, and then it becomes a rallying point for people to defend their beliefs. How dare you say that the Civil War was, uh, or um, sort of the Founding Fathers, um, only cared about what's were creating a land for the, or not creating a land for the free? How dare you say that? And that's fighting words, and that's what I stand for. And you will find that time after time. But the one that always got me is. Um, how uh, the very complex issue of taste buds. And so I was reading about that, and it's about taste buds, and taste buds, uh, um, this very complex thing where individual buds can pick up, um, they can pick up all different types of taste. But when I was in school, and I know it was still in, in some textbooks as, as early as, or as, as late as the 2000s, you know, not that long ago, they, talk, they have um, tongues with a taste map and have sweet and sour in the back and all these different areas. And that was a pure myth, purely made up, and it just kind of perpetuated. Just people think it's true. Okay, that's what we call going on a tangent. So let's get back to the founding fathers.
So when the centennial hit in 1776, current politicians, they're desperate to show that they are fighting for the same thing that the founders fought for. So this is a centennial bond. And look at all the great heroes, uh, uh, all the presidents of the United States shown as this idea of all perpetuating the founding fathers. So it goes all the way from Washington to Adams, Jefferson, Monroe, we got all the way Madison. So here's what they said though, is if that we're both fighting for what the founding fathers want. So Northern politicians are saying, so more and more the Republican party and then Southerners are saying, we are fighting for what the more and more the Democratic Party of the South, because there's only one party in the South. We are fighting for what the fathers wanted. This will maintain the status quo. If we represent what the founders wanted, then you, as a good American, as a patriot, must accept and support what we're doing. And this will maintain the status quo. If you say, I'm doing what Thomas Jefferson wanted, how can you argue against that? If you don't know what Jefferson wanted, you're like, oh, I don't want to say anything bad about Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a great man. And how do I know that? I don't really know that, but people seem to think he is. George Washington wanted this. You'll see the same stuff over and over again as a way to stifle people from trying to change the status quo. How dare you change this? This is what the founding fathers wanted. So they're justifying what they're doing now. And that's the great power of myths. So let's get to one more myth. And this one I just enjoy. Yankees. We've all heard the term Yankees. Anybody who follows baseball and has a soul hates the New York Yankees. I'm just going to throw that out there. But Yankees. And this idea that um, Yankees came to be Americans and this whole... Um, and, <laughs> this is a very stylized three point celebrating the Fourth of July. I just thought it was a great one, uh, um, and actually kind of acting like Revolutionary War soldiers or Yankee Doodles. And Yankee actually came from the word Yankee, a Dutch term for new. And there's a reason why it would uh, come more and more to me Northerners because the New Netherlands was New Amsterdam was New York City, so it was right in that area. Then the British took it. War, and they were called Yankee by the by other settlers around there like in massachusetts because they were basically pirates pirates and freeloaders and they thought that this was a, a um hudson bay was a place where pirates could attack british ships and the dutch were great seafarers of the 17th century and so that's where the term comes from as an insult and so new englanders more and more would take that term yankee 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 kind of americanized but the myth was that this was New Englanders and it represented, you know, ingenuity and creativity and it was a compliment. No, it was actually an insult. And the loyalists and the British would mock it. Here is, okay, it's really hard to follow, but these are patriots during the Revolutionary War and they're mocked as, you can see it there, the Yankee Doodles entrenchment near Boston in 1776. It's mocking it's mocking the revolutionaries as being these kind of illiterate, dumb, crooked, and decrepit and sick, but they mocked them. Yankee Doodles was an insult. And it's one of those great myths that it came about where what happened is New Englanders kind of joked around, said, okay, we're the Yankees and we'll take that. And they took it and turned it around to a compliment for Northerners, and then it had this whole myth about Yankee ingenuity and Yankee creativity. So, here's another myth. And this myth, where are we at here? So a couple more than I'm gonna finish. I think these are just fascinating. I'm sorry if I'm kind of going fast. One thing about doing it on this, first off, I'm looking at a camera and a wall. I can't do it, um, I don't have the, it set up for my window. Because <laughs> you don't want to do it in a window because a bird would fly by and not just stare at the bird. But the pristine myth is one of the biggest myths. And I really like doing this, but I don't know. Actually, uh, it's hard to see when I don't see faces of how it's doing. I'm not a, this, you're going to find this hard to believe, but I'm not a trained thespian, even though right now I'm looking at the camera. But the pristine myth. 
And the pristine myth, this ties in one we've already um, had before, but this was a myth I remember teachers telling me. I had college professors telling me. I read about this. This is in books, in movies, in stories, and people talked about this to this very day. That the America, when I'm in America, not just the United States, the Americas, the entire continent was this wild wilderness and human hands had not touched it. And so I made a typo here and I got to change it. And you're just going to have to deal with it. Okay, so back to this. There was no real sign of human activity. And therefore, it is this untouched, pristine wilderness ready to be civilized. So people of European descent, and then soon the United States of America and other countries that came out of colonization, they aren't conquerors. They weren't brutal, uh, greedy, murderous conquerors, but they were civilizing this pristine land. And in fact, there'll be a whole school of art called the Hudson River School of the 1830s and 1840s. And that's one of the paintings of it, where they showed all these Western pristine sites of this wild forest, ready to be, to be tamed by civilized hand. So we can look back and say, we weren't conquerors. And those who live there, you know, okay, even if you thought, oh, it's, they're, they're noble, but they're still uncivilized or savages, wasting the land not using it, not bringing civilization. And why? Well, this would be a justification. It was, it was a justification for what's going to happen from 1492 to about 16, you know, 1700. It will happen long after that. But in the first 200 years of European settlement of the New World, so from about 1490s all the way to about 1700, about 95% of the American population had disappeared. They had died of disease. They have died of um, also being murdered by the colonists. But the biggest one was the biggest pandemic in history. We've talked about this before. This map shows humanized landscapes. So all these areas here, sorry, were altered by human activity, farmed, controlling of forests, controlling of animals. All of these areas were, um, forests were kept down, animals were kept down so they could um, not trample on crops, preserve crops, um, not overgraze. And all of these areas, one that was really hidden was down here in the rainforest of South America. By the way, you might say, well, wait a sec, that doesn't look like a lot of land. There's a lot of land that's missing. This is hard to find because all it takes is a few hundred years and, or not even, not even a hundred years. What am I saying? And most signs of impact from, uh, from humans would disappear. That just reminds me. So there's this whole thing about videos that people are showing right now of now that everybody all across the world, we're talking billions of people are no longer working every day, but staying at home. Maybe they're working from home, but there's a lot that aren't working. That's um, scary right now. But there's all these sto uh, all these pictures of animals walking, <laughs> walking through the forest or, uh, or did I say walking through the forest? Boy, that'd be exciting. No, all these like animals walking through um, cities because they're now deserted. So I've seen pictures of elephants going through cities in India or uh, you know monkeys going through in Burma or, you know, um, I saw this one in California, a mountain lions going right through the middle of town. And so all these animals are coming out. And that's just after a few months. So just imagine a few hundred years. And so we're talking 95% of the population and there's estimates anywhere from 90 to 120 million people lived on the Amer in the Americas and they're almost all gone. And so it was really hard to imagine were, the Uni were European settlers and therefore the United States brutal conquerors who brought murder or were they civilizers? By the way, there, this is a big argument. Those, you really also could tell your political spectrum too, but those who do not believe that there are that many people here, 
They refuse to believe there are any more than just a few million Americans on this continent, on the continents, a few million Americans before the Europeans came. Uh, they, they get um, very upset. And you can find out a lot if you read um, some of the articles by authors like Charles Mann and a few others. This is actually taken from Charles Mann's book, 1491. And he gets bitterly attacked about how, how can you make this up and how do you know? Well, there's a lot of evidence of this. And one thing I will tell you about this, this always gets me when DeSoto went through this area trying to find well, basically to make um, find gold on a slave hunting expedition on Lake Claim for Spain in the 1520s and 1530s, they found villages of thousands of people. Actually had battle after battle with them as the Soto tried to, to conquer and subdue them and saw signs on the Mississippi River of civilizations that might have hundreds of thousands of cities that turn out to were cities nearly that big. And a hundred years later, when the French came down the Mississippi River, when they came down from the Great Lakes, when the Champlain came down, they not only did not find billions of people, as they thought, is nothing but forest and more animals than ever before, when DeSoto did not, did not find that many. Why? Well, DeSoto had pigs. The pigs, rooting around, helped spread disease that the tribes there did not have. And that would lead to the end. Same thing with the pilgrims talking about a sea of bodies everywhere they looked in 1620. So this is what kind of people do we want to be? And we don't want to be brutal conquerors. But I should add, if we're not brutal conquerors and everything is civilized, we're always civilizing and always getting things better, then why are we even learning this? Doesn't this kind of make history boring if it's nothing more than a story of we um, are always doing this to get better and better and better? First off, yeah, that does make it kind of boring. And I could see why there are a lot of people who think history is nothing more than facts and figures. If all they're taught is um, the founding fathers were great and everything worked out perfectly fine. And there's one more thing about that. Clearly, that's not true. There are problems today, which might shock you. I know, what could be a problem today? Why did they happen? Well, if you believe myths, it's hard to figure out what really happened. And if you believe myths, how do you ever change that? So let's get to the frontier myth. So the frontier myth, look at the time. Okay, so the frontier myth, this is another myth that fits in. This fits in with the pristine myth. myth. And growing up in Montana, we are so ingrained with this frontier myth. This frontier myth that we conquered the West. And so here's this from a very stylistic painting, um, watercolor from the 1850s, bringing home animals and look at the kids having fun. <laughs> Yay, food. But leaving the wilderness, but look at how they're civilizing it. See the crop, the farm, the cabin, they're building, civilizing the wilderness. And a lot of this comes from, now this myth goes on as, as long as there has been the United States. But the historian who really pushed this was Frederick Jackson Turner, who lived actually from what, the 1860, I think he died in 1932. And he wrote about the American frontier and how the American frontier and those ideals created the United States. That is what gives the United States its position, its place, that it is something special. This was Jackson Turner's privilege that the frontier built the United States. And don't forget, I'm saying Jackson, uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, but you know, Thomas Jefferson had the back porch of Monticello facing west because he always dreamed about the west and moving west. He had three different attempts to try to get to, or to have an exploration, eventually culminating with the core discovery of Lewis and Clark. And he wrote down that this frontier, this frontier, is that edge where savagery of this uncivilized frontier meets the civilizing force of the United States, the meeting point between savagery, excuse me, and civilization. And what a key element, because that says we are civilizing, and that's what makes us different. The Europeans haven't had that for a thousand years. They have become 
not, and not stable, but they had become static. They had become um, very centralized power. The individual didn't matter. While the United States is dynamic and growing. And so that leads to this idea of manifest destiny. This idea that it was our duty to spread that frontier west because we are civilizing it. And so therefore we are chosen. And manifest destiny hit at that time of the second great awakening. So a more religious time. And so chosen by God. And don't think this is purely religious God. Jefferson would have argued that as a deist, Yes, um, there's not an interactive God, but God has put us there to spread civilization. That is our job. And you also notice this new economic system of the 19th century, capitalism, to spread that, and that's what everybody wants. And so we have savages, and we are bringing it. And that implies, first off, that there's a steady state of improvement. We're always getting better. And there's unlimited opportunity. All you got to do is hit that frontier and you can bring civilization. You can, just like this picture has it, build your cabin. Grow your crop. You can improve. You can make it. Through your own initiative, through your own ingenuity, you can do it. Only you. And this frontier myth First off, it, see, no how it's tied with the pristine myth, but it also implies that we're on our own. Sink or swim, it's our own. And therefore, you're going to have all these myths of the West and this idea of the, of the West. So as the frontier was dying and the country became more urbanized and the reality of this new economic system called capitalism, where it can be very difficult to move ahead if you cannot afford to buy the capital, for example, the machines. They begin to glorify this. And so you're going to find all these magazines and books, they call them penny or dime novels, that would glorify stories of the West. And I love it. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out how King of the Wild West Cattle Wars and Stella's bout with rival ranchers. Why is she right? Is she on the cow to, to brand it? I don't know what's going on here. Heck, Teddy Roosevelt, who came from a very wealthy old Dutch family, Roosevelt, left New York City. Um, once he got old enough and was no longer sickly, he went west and created this image of himself as the cowboy, even though the term cowboy wasn't even really used yet. As we know, a cowboy actually meant a rustler. They would have said a cow hand or herder or that sort of thing. He went west and kind of fit in with that image that would be grown from these novels. And you could imagine then as this happened, it's no coincidence that the same idea of the frontier would go to the Spanish-American War and to imperialism. If we have the frontier and we've conquered all the American continent, we still have a civilizing job. And so we have to go Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and also expand westward. And this would justify this conquest because it is our duty. The frontier has created us and is the never-ending duty to bring civilization. So here is Uncle Sam sitting back for peace to these people of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Imperialism, the United States getting an empire. So this myth of the frontier and the pristine myth, <laughs> about it a great myth. It's a great myth. It tells us so much about what people in the United States would have wanted to be or to justify what they did in the past. But then that also then justifies what they're doing now. If it worked then, why can't I do it now? Well, of course it didn't quite work the way they're saying. Remember, this is all about the rugged individual doing it on their own in this frontier. And so here's the another Buffalo Bill uh, cartoon, this image of the West, and the first movies, uh, well, actually, the radio shows, movies, and the television would be of the West, and that's where John Wayne, the John Wayne character would be this rugged individual of the West. In fact, John Wayne would become that. And he would become a caricature of, the, of himself. That's from a movie of the 19... <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed Gabby Hayes. I've never seen Lala's Frontier. I just like the old John Wayne poster. And I've seen a lot of John Wayne movies. He would become this caricature of himself, 
of this Western hero with the cowboy hat. And it's shocking how many people try to follow this idea of the frontier. It's still an image today. We live in Montana. This idea of the self-made man on the frontier civilizing. And even though the frontier is gone, that image is still there. All on your own, doing it yourself. And so we have a couple pictures here. First off, this silly, car, uh, this silly ad for Levi's. It's just a couple years old. And this country was not built by men in suits. It's men working with Levi's jeans on. Well, who's buying the jeans? I doubt it's people who are actually out there working the hillside of the rugged frontier. But it fits. It's, I want to be that. And the United States would even vote for people for president. There's Ronald Reagan in 1981. In fact, it's right after he was assassinated. And this is recovering on his ranch. And Reagan is... You'll find a thousand pictures of him in cowboy hats and on a horseback and this Western, this whole image. And it's just simply not true. He was an actor. He was not a cowboy. Yes, he liked to ride horses, but he liked to ride horses like an English gentleman. And he would have to be talked into dressing like a cowboy and wearing a cowboy hat because that's not the way he dressed. But they pushed that image of this rural person because that fits into what America would want to be. Now, I think most people live in cities, but there's the idea we'll go back to this way that life was. Now, was life like that? No, but this is such a big myth. The self-made man did it on his own, and it's just simply not true, or not true. It's much more complex than that, and that leads right next to we have the frontier, the pristine myth, the frontier, to this idea of if we can do this on our own, if this is with a civilizing factor, then what is civilization? The American dream. And as we all know, the American dream involves people in the backyard of the suburbs having barbecue. You got to admit, though, that's a pretty cool shirt. But here is the American dream that would be personified by, I looked for a couple different sources, and I thought this was pretty good. If you can't read it, if you're small, maybe you're looking on the YouTube, on your phone. In the USA, anyone can be free, happy, successful, and wealthy, regardless of their origin and social class. Anybody can do it. Anybody. That is the dream, and that is the whole idea that comes from the frontier myth. This rugged individual, doing it on their own, self-made man, just like they did when they settled, no, I'm sorry, they civilized the forest, this American dream. Now, is this a myth? Yes. Is it possible? That's not the point. The point is, anyone can do it. All you gotta do is up to you. Anyone can do it. It doesn't work that way. No one did it alone, and that's the myth. And so that implies, if everybody can do this and be happy and free, there's competition, right? It's sink or swim on your own. You can either have this home or not have this home. And by the way, I want you to think about it. We're at a time of pandemic. We are locked in our homes. I am broadcasting you. I have a couple screens up and I can see this. A lot of people don't have that. Think about just the difference in that when I say that anyone can be free, happy, successful, wealthy, regardless of origin of social class. I'm modest, I'm a teacher, but I have a home. I'm doing okay, I have a home. It's relatively easy for me to isolate. The vast majority, especially younger people, don't own their own homes. They live in apartments. They're packed into places where it's really hard to isolate. They're packed in with a whole family in very small rooms. They're having difficulty paying their rent. Think about when this ends. It's not like they're all of a sudden going to come out exactly the way the way they were before. They're going to come out behind. Who's getting sick? It's not the people who have the homes and can self-isolate. Yes, they are getting sick. But who's really getting hit are the people who don't have that class. And that's something really got to remember about this. This competition, sink or swim, well, we're not all starting in the same end of the pool. Back to this. Sorry I went on a little tangent there. And so... What does that mean? Well, it could mean wealth. And for the early part of the United States, all the way to the Great Depression, that American dream was, I want my own little piece of land to be a small farmer. And that myth has gone to this day. And boy, doesn't that just fit in with the frontier myth? 
I can go back away from the corruption and um, the influence of all these different people and just become a true American and wear my cowboy hat and act like a, a cowboy. Land or wealth. In this, you'd see more and more the middle class values of the 1950s. This home, car, TV, you know, I'm just giving generics, but you know, the idea of owning that. And there's something about that. That is a myth that by the 1950s, more and more people had that. And the myth became, okay, you're, maybe you won't ever get like rich. You're not gonna have a yacht and you're not gonna have a jet or a, a heliport or that sort of thing, but you can afford to have that. And this comes back to the competition. If you work hard enough, show ingenuity, creativity, a number of different things in this frontier, you can get that. And that is myth, we all can do it. And therefore, if you don't get it, there's something wrong with you. And I, well, I, I'm jumping up, but remember that middle class values. And so here is one I found uh, a point of view of somebody looking back at this past of the American dream. And so by definition, it's pretty conservative, but what is the American dream? And it's faith in the free market, free flow of information and culture, acceptance of government protection of private enterprise. I, I just found this really fascinating. Support of free trade agreements and, and foreign direct invest, investment. I, I was just really like, where did this come from? Okay, this is me. I thought, okay, so they're taking this idea of the American dream, and this is a political point of view that says, don't mess with the free market. <laughs> We want free trade agreements, a.k.a. protect corporations and trade. Um, we, we expect government to protect foreign inter, uh, private enterprise. Therefore, tax money should go for that. This is obviously taking the American dream and setting up the myth of the American dream and giving their political point of view now. And some of you should know, for the most part, this is a, the balance is a conservative economic group. So with that, this gets in them. It fits right in with the myth of the American dream is this myth of individualism. And there is a great quote that I stole from somebody who made this little memes. This is a real quote, but it's Herbert Heaver. And he says, we were challenged with a peacetime choice between American system of rugged individualism, individualism and a European philosophy of diametrically opposed doctrines, doctrines of paternalism and static socialism. And so here he's saying that American system of rugged individualism is what we should do. And instead, what he's talking about here, the European philosophy of diametrically opposed doctrines, the New Deal. And so what he's saying is that we've gone away from American individualism, individualism with this idea of social security, help for labor unions, minimum wage, worker safety laws, Keynesian economics. And his idea would be, we'll pull you up by our own bootstraps. The idea is that uh, no one's going to help me up. I will get up on my own. You've probably all heard that, the bootstrap thing. Pull you up by your own bootstrap, which the myth of that fits right in with. All of these are all intertwined. Your own bootstraps, meaning that you can do it on your own. And so here is my picture of me trying it in the backyard. Try it. Try to pull yourself up with your bootstraps. He keeps doing it. By the way, can you? Pull you up by the bootstraps. That's another example of a combination of what was um, a combination of actually a fable. And the fable was that you can't pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Just like you can't pull yourself up by your own shoelaces, you'll fall on your face. This was meant to mock people who thought they could make like perpetual motion machines. This is the 1830s. Machines that could do everything for you. No, you're gonna have to work together and work. It was the mock it. And the whole thing was meant to, did I go backwards? I did, sorry about that. It was to mock this. You can't pull your back, pull you up by your own bootstraps. We live in a society. We work together. As seen by, you might think you're pulling up by your own bootstraps right now, but you're in school right now. I mean, think about what happened with this. We have a, we have a pandemic and we're all isolated at home. And yet we have set up a system 
that even though we certainly do not fund it as much, and I'm terrified for the future about public education, <laughs> there's me going on another tangent, but I'm worried about budgets in the future. But think about this for a second. One of the first things we do is we still try to set up a system to continue to educate you, to continue to bring education. That's not you pulling up by your bootstraps. That is the community coming together. Nobody conquered the frontier alone. They conquered it. Oh, yeah. The combination of disease, the United States Army or whatever country, the British Army, whatever it might be, through uh, massive tax breaks, governments building up the railroad, uh, government setting up the bank system, the financial system. I mean, Montana would not be a state if not for the government. They built the roads, set up the mines, uh, the farming system. I mean, you can't be a farmer or the agricultural system. You can't be a farmer without the New Deal programs of irrigation. So let's get back to what this really means. Is this a myth about the whole thing about the frontier? And the answer is, well, the American dream isn't quite what they thought. Can everybody do this? Well, this is a chart. This is your birth year, born in 1940 to 19. Um, this one ends in 1990. But this shows the upward mobility and the percentage of children earning more than their parents. In 1940, it was about 10% would earn more than their parents. So there was a chance to move up where your parents were. By the 1980s, it was five, and now we're less than three. So by the time I was born in this area right here, right here, it was still, you know, 6%, but it's been going down ever since. And the United States does not have that upward mobility anymore. People are not moving up. There's a myth. Now, wait, why would they present this myth that we all can still do it when clearly that's not happening? In fact, the, the generation born between 1995, well, the generation that starts in um, 1995 to about 1920, will be the first generation that, on average, will earn less than their parents. And yes, I know that includes you. And that is not the direction that I ever thought. I was born right here. And my belief was this, we all can have that middle class life. We all can have that. By the way, that's why there's such a big political divide between older people and younger people. It's just, that is the reason. People my age and older grew up with the idea that everybody, if they just work hard enough, can do it. Because the system has been set up to give people opportunities. Well, it's not the same system anymore, but they still grew up with that. And that's what they were taught in school and that's what they believe. So the baby boomers and um, what am I, the Gen X or whatever, the, that group there, I'm kind of right in the, between both of them. They believe that. Your generation are taught that, but the reality is, somewhat different. And so this hides the reality. And here's a quote I stole it from somebody else. But this idea of that the hides reality that government and the people have always helped people. And uh, <laughs> we're going to help the wealthy. But if you don't make it out of your poor, the heck with you. And this gives this idea that there is something exceptional. So how can you ever complain? And this justifies inequalities. If inequalities exist, they're supposed to be that way. Because we all, according to this idea, we have this pristine wilderness. And we attack the frontier our own way. We bring civilization by our own merits. And if you don't make it, that's your own fault. And it's hard to complain. This is a way to shut people up. What do people say? Wait a second, it's not fair. Why are you against what everything America stands for? You're not a real American. And, you know, I put up Martin Luther King because Martin Luther King in demanding not only equal political and legal rights for all Americans, but especially for African Americans, he desperately wanted to do something about what he saw, this huge sea of incredibly poor, impoverished people of all backgrounds, all races, all ethnicities, who are stuck in this system where they can't get out. And he was called a socialist, a red, a communist, and spied on continuously. It was a way to marginalize him. He's not a real American. Why can't he just accept what's great about America? So marginalize him. 
And this will keep the status quo. It's a great way to keep the status quo. And I should add that this is happening right now. So we have probably by Thursday, we're gonna have well over 30 million people in the last less than a month have signed up for uh, unemployment insurance. They say about 30% of people trying to get unemployment insurance because it's so difficult to get. If you're if only people who are laid off can get it. And it's so difficult to get that a third have not been able to get it yet. So the numbers appear to be actually higher than what's actually going on. But anyways, um, it's almost, it's difficult. They have a small business loan for small businesses and it's so hard for small businesses to get loans. Um, in fact, most of the loans went to very big and um, relatively profitable businesses and banks made billions of dollars off of this in the um, yet uh, in the um, for, or the second stimulus bill for the pandemic, there were $200 billion in tax credits that over 95% went to the top 1%. The rich or billionaires have made $283 billion since the pandemic made a billion dollars. What um, Jeff Bezos made $26 billion on his own. <laughs> <laughs> since uh, since February, 26 billion. And there are food lines uh, that are miles long and people are, farmers are throwing or um, dumping milk in the sewer, burning corn and other products, um, throwing away meat and eggs, purposely aborting pigs because they, they no one's buying it. I mean, this is a, so we talk about this and yet what happens? We talk about this being, we all um, have the American dream. Well, the status quo is maintained. And one thing, last, last two things I'll get to, last thing, skills. So, the idea that education will solve all. All we need then is go to school, education will solve all. Here's a great cartoon from going up and the idea being you're 20, which way are you gonna go? Get higher education and earn more money? or lower education or not as much. Well, yeah, there's an element of truth there, but all we gotta do is just give you skills. All of you should know about skills because you grew up in the era of Common Core. And the Common Core was all specifically designed to give you skills uh, with the idea of making money and also a way to test teachers, that's another story. But is that true? Is, all, is that all we need? You just work harder in class. Well, actually, it doesn't quite work that way. This is a, um, the influence of parental background and the influence um, of parental background uh, taking social economic differences. So look at the blue line. The biggest point difference in how students do in school is directly correlated to the wealth of their parents. And so, yeah, you know, education might solve all, but really it depends on where you start. And so that leads to somewhat of the myth. And so actually, skills is not solved. I'm running out of time. And so that's the last thing I wanted to get to, but this is where you get cartoons like this, or cartoons. Okay, I kind of do the cartoon. The Atlantic has actually made a big editorial change in the last year, but it was pretty um, supply side economics. But here it has this idea that there's acknowledgement Wow, there's no upward mobility. If someone's, if their parents are poor, they're probably going to be poor. They have less access to education, etc. Well, um, prosperity, overall wealth of the country, not upward mobility. That's what's important. Don't worry if a few people get most of the wealth. If we all prosper, that's where you start seeing articles like this trying to find a way to deal with the fact that the myth is not working. So what are they doing? Trying to create another myth. And the reason I'm telling you this is myths directly relate to political decisions. All right. So I want to get through one more thing. Everything takes longer than I thought, but I just find this fascinating. So, all right. So tomorrow I have changed my mind and I'm going to type it up there. I'm going to put it down for Thursday. Let's do the presentations on Thursday. So that will give two days for me to make sure that I make two big announcements that Thursday will be it. I'll come on tomorrow real fast and say that if somebody can't do it on Thursday, let me know. But let's bump it to Thursday 
So I'll make sure for two days, I'll get as many people there as possible. And I will give, I've just decided this arbitrarily, a participation grade that you must either watch it or show that you've watched the recording of it. So I'll record it. All right. And on that happy note, I am, oh, and I should add, I always try to get too much more than I really want to. It's always a problem. All right. Have a good day. I'll see you tomorrow about 1.30 again, but this one's just going to be a quick announcement unless we have an issue. And let's do it on Thursday. I'll put two days of, of announcements. Goodbye.